Welcome to the Belfry Hockey Podcast. I'm Daryl Belfry. We're in season three, and this is going to be episode six. And what we want to talk about in episode six is the step, the fourth component of the teaching structures that I've been reviewing. Now, this one is interconnected personal structure, and there's a couple elements to it. the The first part of it is the ability to view your personal development as reliant upon the group and and that oftentimes is something that needs guidance from coaches or skilled coaches a lot of players they don't have that initial perspective until it's been properly shown to them and that's something that I think is a major area of opportunity in both coaching and in skill development is that awareness and players will start to learn how to utilize the group more effectively for to both contribute to someone else's player development and to also then have that reciprocate and have the group actually contribute to their own. Uh, most of the time, there's a lot on most teams there's a lot of focus on each individual player just doing their own thing and there's there's all kinds of you know negative aspects that go along with that there's jealousy amongst the teammates uh, there's all kinds of situations where players view the development and the opportunities on the team as a zero-sum game so if if there's opportunity that's given to you, well, then that's opportunity that I don't have. So there's this like, un, like unfounded uh, opportunities that players think are getting taken away from them by the presence or development of someone else. So it becomes a, a real problem. And where a program, a team, an ice time, a skill development ice time where that becomes more enriched is when there's an awareness that's been created that, hey, out here, there's a lot of leverageable aspects here that can make everyone better, including you. And the fact that if you can contribute to someone else's development, that has a way of boomeranging back and, and, and helping you. The better the group gets, the better it is for you. And that is very difficult for a lot of, whether it be player, individual players, or coaches, and I'm talking every level. Um, it's not just kids hockey we're talking about here. This is all the way up, um, where this zero-sum game uh, and the perspective that everything is like, it's a one pie, and if there's a piece of pie that's given to you, well then that's not that's not something that I can have. And, and it takes directly away from me. And that is such a limited perspective. And unfortunately, it's, per, it's prevalent. Um, but I think it can be changed. And those who invest in it will see massive uh, areas of opportunity for every player that, that's, that is under their circle of influence. So that's where I want to start is there. And then there's a whole other aspect that we'll get to in a second. So as, as a coach, you can help influence and create conditions to which this can start building an awareness. So what I, the way I, way I like to do it is I'm not as overt in telling them what it is. I like to create situations in which the awareness is possible and then I can just highlight what just happened. That's the way I, I like to almost like create the create the situation, let it play out the way that it's I intended it to play out and then ask questions to see if I can create a reflection and go, oh yeah, that is right. That did just happen. That's really cool. So then they might be able to see things themselves and it's a process. Like it doesn't, you don't just say it once and then all of a sudden they capture it. It's a, it's a process. Sometimes it takes years to build. Um, and depending on the player's individual perspective, their climate of, uh, the types of cultures that they've played in in the past, uh, the coaches that they've played for in the past, their parents, uh, any uh, any environmental situations that they've been in, it all plays a part in their in shaping their perspective. So you have to you have a, sometimes a lot 
to a lot of layers to chisel back before you can even get into it. So sometimes you got to really get this situation started, start creating awareness, and then off you go. So uh, one of the things that I like to do is try to get two kids or two or more kids to work together to create advantages. So you almost started off where, you know, there isn't that. It's like it's one versus two. And the one is just working and and then you get the two. They usually are working independent of each other. And what you want to try to do is say, hey, like if you two work together, you could get this puck like really fast. One of you kind of leads them in and the other one heads them off at the pass. And now the two of you can work together and you can get this take this puck taken away right away. So you have that perspective of the two learning to come. And there's a there's opportunity many many opportunities will pop up where you can illustrate the fact that they work together gave them both the puck and then they both got a touch and they're both in the points when the puck goes in the net and all of those types of discussions come up and you can highlight a lot of them and then you have the kid that was by himself and then now you make it a two-on-two and you say okay now you have an opportunity now with two or you make it a three-on-two where now, like, if you guys work together as a three, you always have one person open. If that player moves intelligently and you're always looking for who that open player is, you're going to be able to create an advantage here. And it's the extra player that puts you in the spot. And how can we utilize that situation better? You know, what kinds of ways? Then you go into all the puck support, different types of puck support, not just pass support, but you got setting picks, setting screens, you know, moving into space, uh, pick and roll type stuff. You got the use of the boards as an asset. You know, try to figure out different assets and you're like, actively highlighting if the two of you work together or the three of you work together in a certain way, you will be able to create an advantage that is difficult for the opponent to be able to match, which gives you an advantage that gives you a chance to be able to generate more, score more, whatever the objective might be. So that's a simple way, but it's intentional. Like the drills I'm talking about are not earth shattering. You say, Daryl, like literally I do those drills all the time. Yeah, fair enough. But do you do it for the purpose of highlighting the interconnected personal development? Because that's where things change and things have a chance culturally on your team to really elevate. So that's a big part of it. Um, the next thing that I like to do is when you're in a group environment, the highest level of development is available, but is the least taken advantage of. And what I mean by that is because you have so many players in a group environment, you have an opportunity for many different aspects of what's going on in the group dynamic to elevate many of the players. But what usually happens is that there's an elimination of players along the way that happens and there's a deduction and reduction and eventually it just gets down to like a very small number of kids that are actually playing. And those players aren't always working together either. And that's where it becomes interesting. If you watch like really some successful teams one of the things to watch is watch when it gets tight and watch their star player. If they start playing like it's novice hockey where they kick the puck and start skating at one end to the other, then you know they just don't have that. They haven't built as a culture in their group. They haven't built that group. There's opportunity there for everyone. And everyone elevates if we understand how to maximize the group dynamic to not only develop, but perform. And I think that that's, there's a, a lot of work to be done because so often that's not the case. I mean, how many times have you watched a power play where the, the literally what's going on is it's one player versus four. The other four players have no idea what's going to happen. They have no idea how to contribute to the play. They have no idea where they're supposed to go, so they don't do anything. They just stand there. And they have one kid running like a rabbit trying to make stuff happen. 
It happens all the time. Every level. I'm talking all the way to the NHL. You see it. One versus four happens. And you can start to see where there's a real, a real challenge to be able to perform and to develop inside that group and group environment. But if you figure out group, you can achieve miles more both individually and collectively. And that's the key. And being able, but as a coach, you have to prove that. That's a proof of concept because it's a foreign concept to 90% of every player you're going to deal with. That's a foreign concept. Hey, I'm here. It's eat what you kill. I am going to steal, kill anything I possibly can. It's me, me, me. I'm going to do it myself. And that's what happens. And a lot of times that's what's allowed to happen. And it just goes on and on and on. And then if I'm part of that environment, then I'm like, okay, well, I need to be part of the team where I can be me, 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 me. And everything, when do I get mine? I just wait my turn or I move to the next spot and it'll be all about me and that's what I'm going to do. And so then it just, you know, that then the, the collective, that's their experience, which I talk about this all the time. So the, the, one of the most frustrating parts about development for me is seeing the number of kids and players in general who don't ever get a chance to access what is the absolute best parts of our game. They don't get a chance to see it. They never get a part of a group where they can that where the group functions in a way that has a chance to elevate everyone. They just never get it never happens. They play 15 years and it never happens. And then you get other kids where it happens, it's like lightning in a bottle and you see them boom just take off. Those kids, it just doesn't happen enough. That's why I love this podcast because now I can just kind of lay it out there of what I think is going on. And then as you're watching, you can kind of see some of these dynamics and you'll see, I'm, o- I'm only listing a few of them because I don't want it to be a negative thing where I'm just saying all the bad things that happen on a team. You don't need me to tell you that. You can see them. I'm trying to say like where you start to see these like little pockets of moments where Things start to show the potential of what could happen. And then you start to see those things, start to understand that there's other aspects that you could add. And then you start building another thing and then another thing. And then maybe you can get two things to happen simultaneously. And then you can get two things to happen consecutively. And then all of a sudden you're building some momentum as a group. And now you have something, you're enriching the whole experience for everyone. They can see what a real team and a real group can actually achieve when they work together. But that has to come, oftentimes, that comes from coach setting that as a culture. And then you have players who have character who can then see, once it's been illustrated, they can see that and then they continue it on. And then they begin to embody it and then they take control of the group. That's what you want to have happen. I mean, most teams, I don't want the players taking control of the group. Are you crazy? No, it'll be complete anarchy. Like, we don't want that. But if it's done in a certain way, then you want the group to take control of the team. Like They not control the team where they make all the decisions, but they, they, start, to, they start to foster these things because they have a great perspective. They have the character to be able to withstand the pressures that come from that responsibility, which most teams should have no business doing that. They haven't done the work. There's no, the culture isn't even close to being able to support it. And so you're basically just, you're handing the keys to someone who's going to be irresponsible. They're going to angle everything towards themselves. And now you're really in a spot. So that's the kind of stuff like, and, and sometimes you can do it as a coach also, and you can, and this is where I started to really learn in my drill design, there's certain things you can do in drill design to foster these things. You can take a kid who you know uh, would struggle with this awareness and you put them in a spot where there's just no chance for them to be successful. Like the one on two, you're the one, it's just not going to happen. Or you have two kids who don't normally work well together and then you put them together as the two against the one. And I'm just using that as an example because it's so simple and very easy to visualize here. Um, but there's so many different ways in which you can construct the drill to be able to create that awareness. And then you are looking for the clues that you can highlight to offer to the players to be able to get that, start creating those awareness 
uh, as you as you go. Um, one of the things I always really like to do is I like to skate by a player and say like this drill this drill I think is for you. Oh, and you. So then like I pull another kid in. Say I think that the way that this is set up like the way what you need in your game and what you need in your game, I think this drill puts it both together. I can't wait to see you guys working in it's this group together. Now, as the drill goes on, I'm talking to them. And I've already done the same thing with two other kids over here and two other kids over there. So I got these like three, four conversations going on at the same time of them trying to realize why, how I've constructed it. it. It builds itself so that they can maximize the ability for the the two of them to elevate and, and they can utilize each other's strengths because they're paired together for a reason to then elevate. I think that's just really good coaching and I don't know if we see enough of it and that's what I wanted to, that's what I wanted to highlight. Um, the, the last part of it that I think is also and this is like that second piece that I, I wanted to talk about and that is team leadership or group leadership is largely devoid. We have a lot of, every team has a captain, every team's got assistant captains, but I don't know, and I certainly don't see enough of where that leadership actually has a functional value to pull the best out of the group. Because leadership in, by real definition, is the ability to be able to inspire, to uplift, to enable others. That's what it is. It, leadership is about your impact on someone else. We have a lot of people and a lot of players who view leadership on a team as almost exclusively their own personal leadership. In other words, hey, I lead by example. Oh, buddy, like that's literally step one. Let, let, leading by example is literally step one. And you might be able to inspire someone else to lay down and block a shot because you were one to lay down and block a shot. Now, not everyone's gonna lay down and block a shot unless there's a reason and that's where your culture comes in. And that's what I mean, like, what is a real culture? Well, it gets manifested in some of these different ways. And it comes through this team leadership and watching the leadership of your group, watching them pull out best in others. And you, sometimes you're gonna stand there, you're gonna wait for a long time because it's never gonna happen. It hasn't even crossed the mind of any of the players who are of the leadership of the team. It's not crossed their mind. That That's an accomplishment. You think I'm a leader. You think I'm the best player. You think that I can lead by example. At some point, we're gonna need a goal and I'm the best player, I'm the goal scorer, so I'm gonna go score you a goal and that's leadership. No, that's not, that's not leadership. That's a small fraction of what leadership actually is. So as a skill instructor, you're thinking, Daryl, what the hell are you doing talking about this leadership? Like, that's a team thing. Well, I'm in a lot of team environments. I'm with a lot of teams. I'm with a lot of players. Every player I, I work with is on a team. And I work with some of the best players in the world who are all captains of their team. Hell, the last... The, the, in the All-Star game, we had three out of four of the captains in the All-Star game were our clients of mine, and they're leading the All-Star game. These are leaders. They're captains on their own team. They're involved in this stuff, and they are interested in how to become more effective, to pull more people in. Now, what happens is, is that a lot of reasons why the leadership, team group leadership, is struggles is because that group is insecure and I, an insecure leadership group will struggle with the ability to be able to transfer to others because they're insecure. They need everything coming into them. They don't give anything out. They don't give anything back. They're not really trying to foster those relationships in a way in which they can inspire others to do better. They're not encouraging um, it's all fluff. Like they just want to go out and do their thing. And that comes from an insecurity. And so part of your job as a leader, the coach, the skill instructor, is to create environment situations in which you can create a security around the leadership. 
so that they can behave more effectively and not so self-absorbed. And that is a major undertaking. But it's but again, it's a massive area of opportunity and it leads directly to winning. It leads directly to every player getting better. I mean, what's the old adage? What's the best what's the best way to to learn? Well, to teach. That's the best way to learn. If you want to learn something, try to teach it. And then you'll have to figure out how to communicate it. You have to, like, there's a lot of dynamics that come from learning how to teach. That's why it's effective, right? So same here. If I wanted to foster leadership, true, like meaningful leadership, what it's really all about, not what this like bullshit that we sometimes get involved with with teams where we have a captain maybe we like held a popularity contest and you know it, we we voted on who was going to be the captain or we just got the best player uh who was the leading scorer on the team we just made them captain or maybe we're under a lot of political duress to make sure that like the optics of the team make sure that this kid is viewed as a leader and you got all that that goes on i mean all that goes on and you set all that aside and you say, listen, no, I want real leadership. I want to teach what's real. I want to give these kids an opportunity to be able to learn how to an uplift, enable, and inspire people around them and become that true leader on the, uh, in this group, on this team. And be able to bring and pull people in to the group to make people feel part of a group that takes a lot it's leadership it's awareness and it takes a long time to learn that and as a coach you have a responsibility to just keep chipping away over and keep putting them in situations and highlight highlight those opportunities where they can pull someone else in and and sometimes it's just like who are you going to pull in today how are you going to do it how are you going to connect with them don't just ask them you know it's not a Go and ask them like how they did at school or what's going on in their life or give them a high five about their, you know, they just had a, their mom just had a baby brother. Give them a high five. Hey, I didn't know they had, like, that's not what we need here. That's a part of it, of course. Interdynamics, being friends, all that's helpful for sure. But that's not leadership. Leadership is when we're on the ice and we're in the group, what are you doing to inspire, enable me to become more effective. Pull me in part of the group. What are you doing to do that? Are you asking me to be a partner? Are you asking me to get involved? Are you helping me by talking about our last rep and what we were doing? Um, are you acknowledging what I'm doing well? I mean, all these things happen at random, but are they, do are they done in a way in which things continue to, they're done purposefully for the reason of pulling part, pulling people in. Now, here's the real value of fostering that team environment and through the practice habits. And that, that's the other aspect that you can leverage practice habits to inspire people to become part of what you're doing. So you, you make it a point to go out first. You invite a player to come out with you. You invite them into your development plan. Then you ask them about what types of things they want to work on. So you're over there on the half wall, on the on the dot, on the power play off wing because you're going to work on your power play one-timer. The guy you invited out to come with you, they're not on the power play. But you don't, that doesn't matter. You just invite them out there. They start passing you pucks and you're one-time in pucks. And then you're like, hey, you know what? Like I'd like to see, you know, in your game, I think there's plays where you could be better on the wall. You made that one play in the last game I thought was awesome. Oh, wait, what? You noticed me? You noticed what I was doing? You're appreciating what I'm doing? Yeah, I'd like to help you work on that. Like, I think that, you know, you could use your body a little bit more. And when I did it, when I was learning, this is how I use my body to protect the puck. And, you know, I noticed with you, you're protecting it, but the puck's still exposed. Like, here's a trick that I use to get the puck there. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Now you're engaged and you're involved. You know how far that goes with a player? That's true leadership. Now, what do you think that kid's going to do? The one that it happened to them. Well, of course they're going to do it. But if they're alienated and isolated 
and you don't care you don't care what they do and you're only on your own personal plan and if they can't help you you don't want to know them and even though you're wearing the C for whatever reason you're not really doing anything to really pull people into the group dynamic well then that's what's being modeled to this player so eventually that player is going to get to a spot and they have social anxiety that's naturally built up by you not being uh, pulling them in if you don't pull them in and accept them then of course others on the team's not going to pull in and accept them and so now we're in the spot so now this that player goes to another team or the play site or it cycles and you leave and now they're left and now they're in a leadership position what do you think they're going to do well they're going to do the same thing of course as what you did because you modeled the experience but if and that's what i mean like if you can model it the other way what are they going to do? Well, they're going to become good leaders themselves. And so you that's culture, real culture, like stuff that's leverageable towards winning that really matters is the ability to pull people in and 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 take an interest in someone that that you that you may not have otherwise. I mean, what is what is one of the best what is one of the best definitions and indicators of character? Well, it's watching someone do something or acknowledge someone who cannot help them in any way. So like you see kid, people walking in the rink. And I notice this stuff all the time because I, I have been talked to this way so many times. And I've been around really good leaders who do these sorts of things. And I know that's my job to notice things. So I'm walking with someone. We go in the rink together and the Zamboni driver standing there. And the person knows the, the, the guy, the person I'm with, they right away, hey, acknowledge the, the Zamboni driver by first name, go over, have a short conversation with them, maybe a laugh, a joke, whatever, and off they go. That's good leadership. That person has no bearing or impact on their life. You know, there's someone who's cleaning up the garbage, you know, their job is just to clean up the garbage. And the person knows them by their first name and thanks them. Hey, great job. I really appreciate you, you know, the work that you do. They also like, you know, as they're walking by uh, a piece of garbage, they pick it up and put it in the garbage as a sign of respect that, hey, like we're not just here to throw garbage to you. Like that is, that is an indicator that someone has redeemable character. They are willing to outreach to people and invest in people who will never have a direct impact on their own success. That's great stuff. That's the kind of kids we all want. But then we get into hockey, and for whatever reason, we don't actively promote those things enough. I, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. There's lots of places where it happens. I'm just saying we like to talk about it like it's happening all the time, and it isn't. We, we like to talk, every team has a captain. How many of them are actually like really good captains that understand like true leadership and have outstanding character? <laughs> Come on now, let's get serious. So where, why is that? Like, why is that? That is a big part of the hockey experience. A lot of these kids are never going to, met all of them, except for a minute few are going to actually play hockey, play hockey for a living and make a dollar off this game. A small percentage are actually going to go to college or, or play in like at the higher levels of junior hockey. So what are we doing? We have all these years of opportunity in which we can build real leadership and foster these environments. This is what I'm talking about. And then you get to those levels of hockey and you're expecting that this is going to be the case and it's not. Many, many, many situations that captain is really not a captain. And they don't have outstanding character. They just don't. They're just, they're there for, because we need a captain. We need someone over there. Someone needs to wear a C. So guess what? It, it's you. But we haven't done enough. And that's why for me, when I looked at it, I was looking at it initially from just in general, it just irritates me. You watch it, you go watch teams practice and you see the dynamics, and they're not, it's not good. There's not a lot of leadership that's going on. There's a lot of selfishness. Then you go watch the games, they're a hundred times worse. And then they're enabled by the coaching staff to be that way. And it gets really, 
gets really slippery. When you really watch it, it gets very, it's a very slippery slope. So initially I was watching it from that perspective. And then of course I spent time with a lot of high level athletes who are good leaders and who are trying to aspire to be better leaders. And you get in these, I end up in these discussions somehow, some way, and I'm going back and forth with just listening. I'm just listening. And you start to hear the way they talk about these things and it becomes really interesting and the things that they think are important and how they're going to foster uh, foster great leadership. I'll give you a quick example. And this is one of the best examples that I have um, at the NHL level. So we did a few years ago, we did um, the the uh, Belfry Hockey NHL camp at the beginning of, at the end of August. So just before the players were going to go to camp, they all want to skate together. And so they came down to Florida and we did a lot of different things when we had them here. So, and, and some, most of it was to prepare them to, to play. So one of the years we had on one team, we had Kane, Patrick Kane and Austin Matthews. And on the other team, we had Jack Eichel and Claude Giroux. So day one happens. I'm out there. I'm nervous as hell. I'm trying to run this thing. I'm doing drills I've never done before. I'm running games I've never done before. I'm really trying to make this whole thing work. I'm, ele I'm using the whole situation to elevate myself. But I'm hypersensitive on just ha making this thing go and make it productive. So we're going. Everything's going. I get through the first day. I feel pretty happy about it. Like I got through it. It looked like players were pretty happy. They were. They stayed on the ice after for quite a long time. I had good engagement with players who I hadn't spoken to before. I text Patrick Kane. Hey Patrick, what'd you think of day one? His his note back. It was okay. I'm like okay. It was okay. Like seriously. Like I need, I, I'm like only have like five days. Like every day has got to be good. Like, what are you talking about? It was okay. Like, what, why are you not telling me how this can be better? So I kind of, I prob, I probe him a little bit and we have a great relationship. I've known him since he was very young and I'm like, okay, so like, what can I do to be better? Like, how do you want to make, how do we, do we want to get more? Com He's like, we need to get more competitive. I said, okay, what well, we're doing a lot of games. How do you want me to, I, I, there's only so much I can do. He said, leave it with me. I got it. I got to get after Giroux. So next day comes. I, you know, we do a couple of drills to kind of get them organized. We get them moving, get the goalie kind of set up. And then we get into the first game. First game, it's not even, we're not even three, four minutes into the game. And Kane and Matthews and his team, they're up like three, nothing, four, nothing. Kane skates by Giroux as they're coming back. Like after Kane had scored, he's Kim and Giroux are coming off on a line change for the next group to come on. And I'm standing there. And Kane says to Giroux, hey, Claude. Like he calls him G. He's like, hey, G. Like, and he's kind of looking like he's looking at his watch. He's like, we started at nine. Like, uh, we started at nine. Where are you? So it goes, so Drew doesn't say anything. Kane gives him another one. They go out again, next shift, and Drew has really elevated his game. Kane scores again, and he is all over him. And so now it's like 4 nothing, right? Then they go out again, Drew scores, and then Eichel scores, and then now Matthews scores. So now it's getting going, it's going back and forth, right? But got to remember, like, Kane was up 4 nothing. So by the time it was done, I think the game finished, whatever, like 10-6 or something like that. And all the while, Patrick is all over him. Like, just all over him. And it's great. Like, it's fascinating for me. So I'm not doing anything. I'm literally, like, dumping pucks in or passing a puck. Like, that's all I'm doing. The game is going, and I'm just watching this whole thing unveil. So after the game is – that game is over – G, Giroux, skates by and he's like, man, and he used a couple of uh, uh, expletive words, but he was like, I love that. When someone gets on me like that, I love that. And Patrick just knew that that's what was needed. That is, and, and Patrick is taking care of the entire group by elevating Giroux. And it's the first day, like that first day, 
everyone's just feeling each other out. Like, no one's trying to, you know, be that guy. You know, there's still so much respect amongst the group. Patrick knew that that was the case and was concerned that that was going to continue on. So rather than allow it to carry on, he goes right after Drew. He knows exactly what button to push. He pushes that button and then all hell breaks loose. And now we're in one. Like it is an absolute competitive thing that's going on. And they're going at each other. And then what ends up happening? Eichel gets pulled into the whole thing. And he starts to elevate. And his competitiveness comes popping out. And he starts to get, it's like a permission to, let's go. I guess we're going. We're going. And then Matthews, he starts to get going. And all of a sudden, now, and then the rest of the group sees that this is what's happening. And they start to really engage. And the next thing you know, we're off to the races. The difference between day one and day two was night and day. And that was leadership by Patrick Kane who made that happen. And he elevated every single player on that ice because he did that. And that was a big time lesson for me. And once I saw that, I was like, that type of leadership is something he saw. He saw that. That was modeled to him, whether it was through his years in Chicago when they were winning Stanley Cups three out of six years, there were a lot of different players there that would have could have done a variety of different things, whether it was, whether it was you know Taves, whether it was oh uh, Hosa, whether it was some of the players that they had traded for that came in that became really good players, whether it was a guy like David Boland who I know was really influential there was a Duncan Keith, was it Seabrook was it, was it those types of guys, maybe it was the goalie. Maybe that guy was so competitive and put himself in a spot where he just demanded it from everyone else. Like to me, whatever that case was, Patrick learned that from somewhere. And that was modeled to him. And then he brought it with him and he brings it wherever he goes. And he, he figures out what the group needs and he finds a way to get it going, whatever it is that needs to get going. He has a feel now. And I was standing there, I did not have a feel. And I'm like, that's the last day this happens to me. I'm going to watch these dynamics and I'm going to be active in trying to create a group dynamic in which this is possible. Because I saw it. And I, once I saw it once, and then I started to see it more and more and more and more. And... Then I became, it became an obsession of mine, and that's why I offer it to you. And I think that the group dynamic, when it starts like that, and it starts to get going like that, the benefits of that are so massive that once you see it, you get so, and where I'm at is when I don't see it, I get so irritated. It almost feels like whatever we were doing was, it's like a waste of time. And it's not a waste of time. There's a lot of value that comes out of it. But it's not what it could have been had you not fostered that group dynamic and got them that interconnected, interpersonal group leadership. I think it's a big deal. I don't, I'm talking here for whatever, 40 minutes. I'm only scratching the surface of what I've uncovered on what this is. And there's so many areas that we didn't even get a chance to get into. I mean, I'd have to do this for like six hours if we really want to dig into it and all the different examples that have come up over the years that I've figured out. But I want to give you an insight and a taste and have you get to a point where you're the same as me, whether you're a player or whether you're a coach or whether you're a skill instructor, where you're like, this is something that we need to find a way to leverage and I need to figure out how to build character we talk about building character but let's be honest there's not a lot of character getting built in a lot of, in in many different ways things do happen fair enough there are some good situations but more often than not there's a co complete devoid lack of leadership across the board and then we have no group dynamics. It's about as selfish and self-centered as it gets. And it's a one small pie that everyone's trying to protect because they don't want anybody to take any of that pie because that's going to take directly away from me. And we have to be much more sophisticated than that. 
and figure that out. And so what I've done is I've tried to figure out how to use that in, a, in, a, in the dynamics of a, of a practice and a team dynamic or by groups and in my hockey camps and stuff. I'm actively trying to push this because I think it's that important. And I think that now that I've kind of brought up a couple of different things, hopefully you'll, uh, you'll resonate. It'll resonate with you and say, you know what? Yeah, there's probably a lot more that we can do.